Hi guys, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I did a video not that long ago, about a, a week ago I think it was from uh, this point, um, where I was talking about centre of percussion, that is the point on a blade, on a sword blade, which generally gives the most effective cut with a blow. Okay, so that's the portion of the blade that you should aim to hit someone with. And a simple way that I showed to do that was you get something that you don't care about very much, um, you can do this lightly tapping on your hand, but if you've got a piece of wood to hand or cardboard tube or something like that, um, or, or you know anything really lying around that you don't mind hitting, um, you can do this. And essentially you'll notice that when you hit the object, uh, when you hit it near the tip of this type of sword at least, um, it will sort of have a bouncing effect because it's a lever and it's giving you energy back. But you get to a sort of dead point, okay, where all of the energy feels like it's being transferred to the target. And then as you move further up the blade, or down the blade, depending which way you look at it, um, it starts to bounce again and it just doesn't feel like you're transferring much energy to the target. So very simply, you can feel in your hands that when you get to a region about there, bam, it even makes a different sound as well. And on this type of medieval sword, it's usually about there. I describe it to my students as the top of the third quarter. So if we go one quarter, two quarters, is obviously half up the blade, three quarters, and that's the full blade, the top of the third quarter and the beginning of the last quarter tends to be the region where you transmit the most force to the target with a typical sword. Um, I don't want to get into debates about physics, about the tip is travelling fastest, so we'll transfer most force to the target, blah blah blah, and I know there have been Scientists have tried to uh, explain ways why the uh, tip of a baseball bat will um, transfer the most force. But the fact is that everybody who uses um, bats and sticks and um, tennis rackets and swords knows that that part is the bit that has the most effect on the target. So uh, for the purposes of this video and the previous one, I don't care about the science because essentially it's a very complex thing and there's lots of things going on. It's not simple MV or MV squared, it's not simple Newtonian, there's uh, leverage, there's flexing, there's all sorts of weird things going on when we hit something. All we need to know is, here's a lump of wood, here's a sword, that's rubbish, I can feel it in my hands, and that's really good and that's hitting with a lot of force and that will take my thumb off if I'm not careful. Okay, um, So hitting with that portion of the blade, I can feel it in my hands, I don't care um, which, which analyses and which uh, formulas you throw at me, I know that that's the bit that hits the hardest because it's completely demonstrable. Okay, right. So that's the first thing. Um, I demonstrated that this is how you measure the center of percussion. And yes, someone pointed out, I described the center of percussion as an area, which is not strictly speaking true. There is a point which is your optimum center of percussion. However, what I was trying to explain was that with different types of swords, you might get a small area that transmits quite a lot of force to the target and pointy swords, um, like the mercenary there, can be more um, temperamental, more specific um, about that than others. Whereas broader bladed swords, or swords with more mass at the tip, like a falchion or indeed more like this, tend to still transmit a lot of force over a wide area of the blade and they tend to transmit force further up the blade. So a pointy sword, the central percussion will generally be further down. A broader bladed sword or a sword with more mass at the tip, the central percussion will be further up. So that's what I explained in my last video. There is another point which a lot of people commented on, um, which I'm fully aware for many years, people were under the impression that you find the central percussion of a sword by holding it in one hand and hitting the pommel. And you'll notice when I do that, there is... A, a node of resonance. In actual fact, there's two nodes of resonance, and in fact, if it's a very long object, um, there can potentially, I think, be more than that. Um, but you'll notice that when I hit the pommel, I know you can't see all the blade when I'm doing this, I don't think I can do this horizontally very well. So what I'm doing is holding it in one hand, so I'm holding it at one of the pivot points, which would be roughly where my hand is usually, on a, on a good sword, and I'm hitting the pommel there. And you'll notice when I do that, the tip of the sword goes wibble, wibble, wibble flicks from side to side, and the middle of the blade also flicks from side to side, but there is a portion in the middle, 
that more or less doesn't wibble from side to side. Now, you will notice that is in more or less the same place as the centre of percussion. However, it is not showing you where the centre of percussion is. The centre of percussion is me measured in the way that I showed before, with force transmission. Okay? That is in this plane. Theoretically, it has almost no relation to what happens in the plane of the flat. The node of resonance is telling you about what's going on in the flat of the blade. That's a plane which is at 90 degrees to the edge. Now, if a sword is very, very thin and wobbly, and you do a bad cut, that is, if the edge is not perfectly aligned, you might get some lateral side-to-side -side wobble, and that might possibly although the jury is still out, I believe, impede the effect effectiveness of your cut. However, absolutely doing this only tells you where the node of resonance is. It does not tell you where the central percussion is. This is the best and easiest way for most people. There are ways you can do it with pendulums and, and swinging things and formulas, but this is the easiest way for most people to tell where, where the central percussion is. And out of interest on this sort, let's just see the centre of percussion, right, is there. Okay, I've made a mark on it with my uh, greasy glove here. Now the node of resonance ha, is an inch higher. Okay. So the node of resonance on this blade, as an example, I could obviously do it with other swords, but that would get quite boring quite quickly. The node, on re the node of resonance on this sword is actually an inch higher than the centre of percussion. They are not the same thing. They are not even necessarily at all related. They don't have to be related. However, and this is where the confusion comes from, a lot of good swords whether by design or coincidence, and you could debate that point, have a node of resonance in the blade which is close to, or can sometimes even be in the same place as, the central percussion. However, they are not the same thing. Okay? So do not confuse finding out where the node of resonance on a blade is with where the central percussion is. They're not the same thing. Okay? The best way of finding the central percussion, or the easiest and even the crudest, but the easiest and quickest way of finding where the central percussion is, is doing what I did with the piece of wood, which you could do with a cardboard tube or whatever else. Okay? It's not the same as node of resonance. Node of resonance is lateral movement. And um, there is no hard and sure proof, in fact, that node of resonance makes very, difference, makes very much effect or difference to your cutting performance at all. Because if you have a very stiff blade, then it won't wobble from side to side very much. And indeed, if you hit the target perfectly with the edge, your blade won't wobble from side to side very much. So in those circumstances, it's irrelevant where the node of resonance is, more or less. When it does matter where the node of resonance is, is if you've got a blade that is able to wobble quite a lot, if it's quite a thin, wibbly blade, and if you don't hit with perfect edge alignment then potentially, maybe, the fact that you've got a blade that flexes a lot and that has a, a vibrational node in a certain place might possibly affect your cutting if, uh, potential or, or um, potency. Right, now, the final point I want to make is um, in a video, well I'll be frank about it, it was a video that uh, Scalagram just uploaded, that I, I wasn't going to say who it was, but it was Scalagram's video I just uploaded. He made a statement which I sort of disagree with, and I'm sure that he didn't necessarily mean this to be a certain point, because I know that he knows all this stuff. But he said about a blade needing to be flexible. Actually, no. A sword doesn't need to be flexible. In actual fact, generally speaking, the stiffer you can make a blade, the better. Okay? So the stiffer a blade is, the less likely you are to suffer from this blade wobble. And indeed, if you don't hit with perfect edge alignment, the, a stiffer blade is more likely to drag its way straight and drag its way through the target um, than, than a wibbly blade. 
Um, and indeed, in defensive motions, if your blade is stiffer, that's better. Because if your blade is wobbling a lot during defensive motions, that's not a good thing. Equally, in a bind against another blade. So if someone's pushing their blade, and I'm opposing their blade and pushing my blade into them, yes, while I might aim to push my edge into their flat, um, or I'm pushing my edge towards their sword at any rate, um, sometimes that doesn't happen, sometimes you're a little bit flat on and so you don't want to really, you don't want a floppy blade in that circumstance. However, thin, wibbly, floppy blades did exist. Why did they exist? Well, for the very simple fact that sometimes you want your sword to be light and sometimes you want a blade to be thin because a thin, light blade will pass through the target well, assuming you have good edge alignment. Um, so, like with everything, as I've said in the past, it's a trade-off. Generally speaking, if you add to a weapon's potential in one regard, you subtract from it in another regard. So if we want to make the blade very light, and if we want to make the blade very thin, then unfortunately it also becomes more wobbly. Okay? So one of the reasons why a katana, for example, is quite heavy for its size, is because it's a very thick blade. Okay? So what you're what you're giving up is lightness. The katana is a relatively heavy blade for its size, but what you gain is stiffness. So it's everything, it's a balance you're giving and taking with all of these designs. It's a compromise. So moving on slightly and developing that point, as, as I said, not all blades are flexible. Not all blades are spring-tempered. And as we know, um, bronze age swords won't do that. If you bend a bronze age sword, it, it, it will stay bent. Equally, if you bend an iron age sword, it will stay bent. And you know what? Even after they developed steel swords um, with good quality steel, not all steel swords are made in a way that makes the blade flexible. As I've mentioned many times before, if you take a traditionally made katana and stand on the blade, it will bend and it will stay bent. The fact of the matter is, is that the way that a katana blade is made uh, provides a very, very hard edge. That's the advantage. It's a very hard edge and it's a stiff blade, uh, it's a thick blade, because it's not made as a spring. You have to make the blade thick because it won't flex like a European sword. If you bend it, it will stay bent. Okay. Equally, many tulwars and Middle Eastern swords, shamshirs and some kilich, um, if you bend them, if they're made of woots, woot steel was very often not spring-tempered. Okay, so this sword is woots. If I bend it, which I can promise you I'm not going to do, if I bend this sword, I can guarantee you it will stay bent. It will not spring, but it's a very thick and stiff blade. So uh, there we go. Uh, to, to conclude, the final point I want to make in this video is very simply, we're used to talking about European swords like they are springs, because traditionally, at least after the Iron Age, we're even debated actually after the Roman period, they were more or less springs, although I'm not entirely sure that all um, Dark Age, if we call it that, early medieval migration era swords were spring-tempered. In actual fact, according to some of the saga descriptions and such like, I suspect that a lot of the earlier pattern-welded swords were not spring-tempered. I suspect that they were like Indian woot swords and that they were actually hardened at the edges, um, but if you bent them they would stay bent in many cases. There are references in the Viking era to both swords which you can flex as a spring and swords that you can't flex as a spring. So. There's a lot more research that needs to be done in that period. But certainly later medieval swords are made like springs and Renaissance swords and obviously Victorian swords. Basically we are used to in Europe and most, most parts of the world, most parts of North Africa and uh, China and so on, uh, swords are made as a spring. However, not all swords are made like that. There are swords like katanas, some tulwars, um, some, uh, some shamshir and kiliches are not spring-tempered. If you bend them, they'll stay bent. And therefore, they tend to have thick blades to protect them from being bent, essentially, to keep them straight. Uh, but a stiff blade is, generally speaking, in most situations, better than a flexible, uh, flexible blade. And you only go for a highly or easily flexible blade if you're aiming to gain lightness or thinness of the blade.
There we go guys, cheers. Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.